Hello folks, this is Jeremy from the Ranger Project, and today is both a sad day and a happy day. It is our last episode of Just the Ten of Us, the 47th episode overall, 23rd episode of season 3, was just meant to be the season finale, it became the series finale. Today we're watching Slaughterhouse 10, directed by Mike Sullivan, written by Bill Kirkenbauer and Brad Slate. This episode first aired on May 4th, 1990, so... The sad news is we've reached the end of Just the Ten of Us. The good news is, one, we're not done with Just the Ten of Us. I am not stopping Just the Ten of Us on this channel. We are going to, I'm probably going to take a short break of a week or two. Uh, I'm hoping to start back with the Lubbocks on Growing Pains. I can't do the entire episode for sure. I don't even know if I can do just the just the, the Lubbock snippets of, of the Growing Pains episode. If not, I'll do it podcast style where I just kind of, you know, freeze frame the image and talk about it. And I'll provide a link for where to watch it. The good news is the Growing Pains episodes are much more readily available than just 10 of us, which isn't really available. So uh, and then on top of that, I also have the pilot through about, I think, episode eight. Uh, where I haven't done the non-syndicated versions yet. So I do have that to, to share as well. And then after that, I'm going to keep doing just a 10 of us, even though I'm not fully sure how yet. So don't go anywhere. Don't unsubscribe. We're going to keep watching. I also plan to release a video uh, in the interim as well about maybe what we can do as the fans to potentially help there be a reboot. If I'm being perfectly honest, do I think the odds are likely we can reboot the show? Who knows? Who would have ever thought that some of the shows that have been rebooted have actually done so? We don't really want to reboot. We want a continuation. But that's going to require some letter writing to Warner Brothers. And I'm going to do a video here pretty soon all about who to write to, what to say, and what we as the fans can do to potentially help this happen. So... We have that coming. The really good news for today, though, is that I am not reacting to this episode alone. I'm reacting to this episode with Bill Kirkenbauer and Brad Slate. They were the writers of this episode. Bill, of course, is also our very own Coach Lubbock. So it was such an honor to get to talk to both of them as I watched this groundbreaking episode of the show with them. And if you had asked 12-year-old me back in 1990... If I ever thought I would get to watch an episode of my favorite sitcom with the dad of that sitcom, I couldn't, wouldn't have even known how to respond to that. So as a fan, I can only say this is an absolute dream come true. So I'm not going to have a closing for this one just because I don't really have anything to say other than what I say in this episode. Um Bill has some amazing, some great insights, as does Brad, into just the whole process, thoughts behind the show. This one, I cannot show my appreciation enough for the cast and some of the writers of this show for the love they've shown us fans as I have reacted to this series, as we have kind of created this new Just the Ten of Us revival on YouTube. So let's keep it going. Even though we're done with, you know, there are no more new episodes for now, I'm not ready to give up. There are still some cast members that I hope to get on camera at some point. I would love to watch Smoke Em If You Got Em with Heidi Ziegler, who, of course, played Sherry. Um, I desperately want to get Jamie Lunar live on camera at some point, if we can, there's so much I still want to explore in this world. So thank you for for watching this show with me. Uh, the fact that we're here today is solely because of those of us who are fans of the show. So it's been a blast. Let's talk about Slaughterhouse 10. Jeremy, this is Brad. Brad, this is Jeremy. <laughs> I know you guys met each other because I heard you talking. <laughs> yes. Well, I just want to say as both a fan of the show um, and, you know, the guy who obviously does this channel, I cannot thank you enough for both doing this. I hate that this is our series finale. It just, it still, it makes me sad. 
Um, huh. but <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, how do you think I felt in real oh, time? I cannot even, I are remember we recording now. We are, we are. I've, well, I'm glad you said oh, that. Okay. I'm going to, I have my screen recorder going, but I also want to record on zoom just in case. So you may get a, okay. I'm glad you said that. Cause I like to double dip yeah. just in case. Okay. So now we're live. We are recording. Um, any, I can edit out anything that, and I've is got this said a that big thing here telling me this. Okay, got it. There you go. I didn't yeah. see that. Okay. Now I have to have permission to record my students when I'm on I, Zoom. <laughs> I see. Well, there have been so many fans who have just come out of the woodwork loving the show. There are people who are watching it on Friday nights just at, at 8 30 Eastern, like they used to on, on this channel. Uh, and I think both of you, I mean, Brad, I know this was, um, was this the only episode of the show that you wrote? Yes. Yes. Okay. I wrote with Bill. Um, they, uh, that was part of your contract, wasn't it, Bill, that you could write a couple episodes or an episode? No, I just asked him to, and they said, okay. Well, see, that's the power of the Kirkenbauer. <laughs> Yeah, we co-wrote this, and it, I didn't know it was going to be the last one because they liked it. And, you know, I also thought that I'd be there in the future to write some more. Well, in, in a just world, you would have been. Um, it would have been one thing if they'd replaced you with a show that had, had like, a great longevity, but yeah. um, it was a hot mess that I think was retooled yeah, after, they, like, they, six they, episodes. Uh, literally, they uh, metaphorically uh, threw the baby out with the bathwater. Well... On my channel alone, I've had over 30,000 watch hours of just just the 10 of us. Um, there are people who love the show. I am one of them. I am just a fan who enjoys, you know, talking about it and sharing it. And I hate that well, I've made it to the end. <laughs> I just want to say uh, that uh, when I discovered this channel, which was probably, you were probably eight or nine episodes into it, I started watching it. And I hadn't seen all these shows before. But I just want to say... Uh, I have to say that you've done a wonderful job. You, well, thank I can you. tell that you have, have a real caring for the show. I think a lot of uh, the comments that you uh, made have been insightful and spot on. Um, I think that you uh, have a real understanding. And, and, and the fact that you're a teacher, I said to my wife, a couple weeks ago, you know, I just kind of forgot it. He's a teacher too, so he has this connection. And then your religious background, so, so you're like the perfect guy. And you're not, uh, you speak well. Oh, thank you. Uh, you're, you're educated, you're articulate. So if I were going to cast somebody to do this, I would cast you. Excellent. Well, I'm so happy to hear that. I can't wait for the paycheck for that job. That I'm looking <laughs> yeah. forward to it. Me neither. <laughs> Uh, I've actually had more than a few people say, you kind of look like Bill. I'm like, well, I've got a lot of weight on him, but we're, we're big, bald guys. And I don't think, you know, there's much more to it than that. But, um, you know, maybe <laughs> well, if there's I, a I reboot. I have a real love for the show. I do. I, I absolutely I, do. I always appreciate it because I know the shows that I grew up with are, are my nostalgia. See, everybody has their own nostalgia, depending on when you were born. And I was born in 1953. And so my nostalgia is Leave it to Beaver and Captain Kangaroo and Sky King and Superman and the Three Stooges. And that's my nostalgia. And to someone who was born in 1991 or, 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 or 2000 even, just gosh, somebody born just in 2000 is going to be 22 years old. Those, they, those, those people know nothing about this. Yeah. So I think you know, it's great that you've immortalized the show on YouTube, and people all over the world now can can watch it with 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 the commentary. So it's a whole different world than it was. And frankly, your your commentary has given me a different light on it uh, on the show. When you say, you know, I'll be honest with you, when I used to watch this show, I thought, oh, this, you know, some of these uh, sex jokes and stuff, or I don't know, it's just a little corny. But now when I watch this show, I realize, and you said this a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't like the other shows. It, it was a little edgy. I, I used to yeah. think it was just not, it was a little edgy. Yeah. And when I compare it now to what other, for say Full House. And, uh, and I think, well, you know, yeah, yeah, it is. So I look at it through the eyes of a man who's, you know, 35 years older and, and, um, and your, your comments on it from your perspective have given me a new perspective on it as I watch these. 
Well, I think, Bill, you're part of the reason that you could get away with it. It's like I used to work with a, a comedy duo partner, Buzz Belmondo, who used to be on Out of This World. And there was something about when he would do jokes, when he would do material, he could get away with things others couldn't. And I think Bill's comedic abilities sold a lot of stuff as being real and organic. And it didn't come off, you know, like, oh, that's force, that's dirty, that's whatever. I, I can wholeheartedly agree. Like there are nothing ever like there are some jokes that, like to the point that I know that 12 year old me when I watched the show back then did not get they flew over my head. I'm appreciating them now as an adult, um, but it's the delivery. It's it's the fact that you all felt like a family. Um, I still say that Graham and Elizabeth were the best TV parents of that era. Um, they. You know, we'll be- it really is a family and it's, and it's made up of other people that you never see. Sure. Uh, we just lost George Dibby a couple of weeks ago. And I think this is an appropriate time. I, I, unfortunately they had the memorial on my birthday. Uh, so I was distracted with my son and stuff. And of course I'm, I, I live in Thailand now, uh, so I couldn't go, but, uh, you know, it was a big family of people that people don't understand. I, I talk to people who think we shoot this in a day. <laughs> people say, oh, what do you go in the morning and then you shoot it in the afternoon? I go, no. Now, in fact, I have a video on YouTube that explains how, how the average sitcom is made. A lot of people have no idea. They think you go in and do it in one day or, 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 or something. They have no idea what the process is like. And there's so many people that work on these shows, the carpenters that work all night hammering and putting sets together, the painters, the set decorators, the guy that gets up early to go get the bagels so you'll have something to eat when you get there, the guy that goes and gets your, your trailer at 4 o'clock in the morning and drives it all the way across Los Angeles to park it so you'll have a place to go in and put your stuff when you get on set if you're somewhere else. When we would occasionally shoot uh, you know, out of the studio. Uh, the makeup people, the costume people, the editors, I mean, just literally a hundred people are- The born. animal wranglers for this episode. Yeah, the animal wranglers, the kid wranglers, the kids' teachers, <laughs> all these people, the, the network executives, the studio, all these people that work on these shows that you never see. You only see, you know, the people on the, on, on the camera. And uh, George Dibby was a true, uh, a true artist with light. Um, and he, he, he uh, passed away a couple weeks ago and he was the one that won the Emmy. He's the one that allows me to say my Emmy award winning show, just the 10 of us. So he's the one that was responsible for that. And he really was a great guy and he was part of the family. So when you say we're, we're a family, it's not just the family on the screen, which we were. I mean, I felt like when these guys would come on and do a guest shot for the week and they, they were looking at the girls, I really did feel like their father. Hey, 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 uh, go somewhere else. You know, that kind of a thing. So, it, and, 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 we, and we still, but when you spend all that time with people for three years, you know, uh, you become a family. And, and I think it, it comes across on the screen. It, it definitely does from, from my perspective. And again, I, I had a, I had a, a reaction like this with um, a few of the the Lubbock babes and and Doozler with the Virgin Islands episode, and even just then, you could tell like there is still a bond there. I mean, it's I'm thinking of the podcast reunion you all did last or the summer before last. It's yeah, and I think that's part of what made this show what it is. And it allows Bill to legally and without malice have two wives. <laughs> I have a TV wife and I have a real life wife. Yeah. Some guys have a, and I have and, and I had no wife. children. I had no children at the time. So I didn't know I was not a father yet. Um and it's a, you know, there's an episode called Rat Boy Lives, which um, I have one of my favorite scenes with me and Matt Shackman. And uh he went by this rat boy. And a few years later, when my son was born, he was about five or six, he used to uh, have lots of pet rats. That was his passion. And I started calling him Rat Boy. That's great. And uh, I said, you know, that, that show was so uh, 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 what's the word? We kind of predicted, in a way, uh, the, the future of me and my, my son, who actually was a rat boy. 
<laughs> and I used to say, Lynn, I said, it's funny, of all those things they could have picked, it kind of came true with, with my, son, my son, Reed. That's great. Well, I think either on the channel or on social media, I feel like your wife mentioned that that last scene in the show was always really important to you. Like it was one of your, your favorite scenes from the series. Yeah. Yes, it was. I've had a, this, the scene in this episode, we're going to watch too. I have a few scenes. Uh, it, if, if you don't mind, I just want to say how this kind of, this show came about. Sure. Um, you know, I, as you become a character over a few years, you kind of start thinking about it. And I don't know, one day I was just watching one of those TV ads where they're trying to sell you a side of beef. You know, come on now, we'll sell you a whole side of beef. And I got And I was thinking, well, it'd be funny if the coach saw an ad like that. And instead of going and getting a side of beef, he actually came back with a cow. And then I saw the conflict was that, uh, you know, the girls were, oh, you know, hide them or some. Uh, the writers, now, again, this is how... This is how things get done. A lot of people don't know that. Even though Brad and I wrote and delivered a script, that that script changed a lot. And they always do. They they edit and write and do. So they took our script and and ran with it. And then they added the part about the girls going and getting the now I don't wanna I don't wanna blow scenes or anything, but uh, they added the other aspect to it. Let's put it that way. And which which worked, but I I, I thought it was, it was it was one of my favorite episodes, actually because I I, I wrote it along with Brad, but I, I thought it was funny and I thought it had some good scenes. I like the episodes where you get to think, you get to laugh, maybe you get to cry just a little bit. <laughs> and I think it had its one. poignant moments, especially <laughs> yes. the last scene when the with the cigar, but we won't get into that. Yes, yes. Well, maybe we should just watch the show now. And now you had something else you wanted. This is your show, Jeremy. So, so you. Whatever you want to do now. Am I still there? Do we lose Jeremy? I lost the sound. Sorry, I have a mute button on my remote, and I, <laughs> I hit it, and then... Oh, okay. No, I was just saying, whenever I have someone from the show on, which is only the second time I've done this, I want to talk the least, because people want to hear what you all had to say about it. Um, oh. And I'm I'm very excited, so... What? Okay, what? well, I've said just about everything I want. Brad, you want to add anything to this? <laughs> Only that, you know, it was a compliment in a, in a strange way when the executive producer said, you know, when we get scripts, because they're always written by committee and sitcoms uh, in the writer's room, they punch it up and add things, as he said. But he said, of all the scripts we've done, yours had to be, uh, you know, added to the least, <laughs> changed the least. I go, oh, oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> well, that's good. I never heard that. I don't remember hearing that. No, yeah, Brad, no, but, you it know, a, yeah. it's it's a whole changing, developing, ongoing thing over that course of four or five. Not four. It's like three days. You know. I mean, sometimes I get that script and we rehearse, and I throw. I'd always threw the script away at the end of the day because the next day or that night they would deliver me something else. And so and, many uh, changes so not, that it goes from because they add a color every time they make changes, the, the color right. changes. So it's like so many it songs, only, like a show I worked only, on before as an actor, they changed the color so much it ended up going back to white by the time we shot the show. Yeah, and I have to say they always improved it. There was never an episode. With, sometimes they'd have to change it a lot. Sometimes they wouldn't change it so much, but it was always an improvement. And it was actually backwards from the way that I was used to working because I worked on Mork and Mindy and uh, with uh, working with Robin, uh, they did it totally backwards, which was that the first day you just got to play with it and make stuff up and do all sorts of playing around and developing and they'd make notes and then you do the run through at the end of the day and you kind of add some of that. So it was real loose. And they keep some of it and they throw some of it out. Uh, there was a thing I improvised on one of the work of Mindy's where I'm hitting on Mindy and I and I had studied mine and I did this imaginary wall thing. I just made it up and they, oh, they loved it. And so it stayed in the, in the script. But, with the, but when I, and, and so what happened was you'd start out loose and then you'd get tighter and tighter. And by the time you, you would uh, uh, shoot the show in front of the audience, you knew pretty much exactly what you were doing. Well, these guys, they did it opposite. They were very tight and they said, no, no, just read what, we're, what we wrote and blah, 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 and then keep it tight. And I wasn't really allowed to improvise at all. 
In fact, I was told at one point, uh, uh, just kind of <laughs> shut up and act. <laughs> that was kind of it. I don't want to go any further than that, but it was kind of disappointing uh, because I was used to playing around, and that's why I thought they, you know, had hired me. But um, uh, so, but this was totally opposite from more committee. And if they started out tight, I could not improvise at all. And then on shoot day, when we were in front of the audience, he'd come up and say, oh, listen, say broccoli instead of potato. And I go, geez, I've been, I've been sitting, rehearsing potato all week, and now you want to change it to broccoli. You know, why could we have changed it to, you know, on Monday? And so it, it was a lot of last minute adjustments that I had to make that I I would manage to make, but I don't like doing that. I would rather know what I'm doing right in front. You know, mess around and play with it in the beginning and then hone it and get to where you know where it is. And, and they did it totally opposite. So it was a it was a little hard. I prefer it the other way. <laughs> because some of the stuff, best stuff I've ever done on screen is stuff that I, that I improvised. So uh but that's the way it was and it was it was you know it still worked out. Well, so I obviously not working in showbiz. The last time I acted was like a church play in fifth grade. Um, there, there's a there's a lot I don't know, but I've feel like I've picked up a little bit just watching various things on YouTube and such. Um, so, Brad, did you have a copy of the script that you held up yes, to the I camera do. just a moment ago? I, and oh. it's weird because I, you know, in the back of it, everybody signed, uh, but it, it, this was. Uh, this is a generic uh, front to it. And then that ticket was the very first show they ever, you know, a ticket to the very first episode of just the 10 of us in, um, what was it say, uh, 1988. And then, of course, the reveal, nice enough to give us credits on the, uh, on the there. So I just read it yesterday. No, I'm going to do this. I just reread it. It is, there's some funny things in there. Well, I, I am excited to watch. I'm excited to hear what you all have to say about it. Uh, Bill, when was the last time you actually watched this episode? If Oh, at least a few years ago. Okay. So it's not definitely not fresh, uh, something you've watched uh, recently. No, no, you know, some of, some of these shows I've watched with you, I go, I have no remembrance <laughs> of doing that. Really? I don't remember. There was one show. I, I, I don't think I was in it that much, but I was like, I don't remember this at all. <laughs> I mean, well, not, not, not at all. Sure, I'm sure so your own memories of the behind-the-scenes stuff that we don't see, I'm sure, bleeds in. And well, that's, You know, it's funny. When, when, when you're shooting stuff, um, you know, that's the magic of And I tell people this, the magic of, of movies and television. I've done some movies since, and, and some television stuff that when you're doing it in front of the camera, like I've done, I did a, cheap B movie called Gorp years ago we shot in a summer camp and and they had the cameras and they have all the thing that looks like a movie and but you're doing it in front of it and it feels stupid it just feels stupid and lame and stupid but then when you go look at it up on the screen that's where the ma movie magic happens and you go oh that stupid thing I was doing that looks like a movie now and unless you've ever done this, you don't understand. You feel, I felt so stupid doing that. But after they edit it and they add the music, and then you see it as a movie, you go, oh, that looks pretty good. <laughs> By the way, one side note about this, because I remember, because I brought my girlfriend, um, this episode wasn't filmed in front of a, a live audience because of the animals. Huh. They thought that, you know, like the cow was going to run through the crowd like King Kong or something. I don't know. But yeah, uh, he, he, Brad reminded me of this. I, I forgot that. But yeah, we, we just shot like a movie. So any of the laughter we hear then, is it just literally canned laughter or was it laughter captured yeah, from a, a they, screening? They might have or? Shot it, you know, without those scenes. I, but I don't remember that. I, I do remember going to the taping of the day when, when they were shooting it with the animals. And, you know, I, th I pretty much remember the whole episode there. Well, on tape day, what we did, here's another thing. Here's another little difference that different sitcoms do. Um, a lot of sitcoms, you'll go in at nine on, on tape day. 
You'll go in at nine o'clock and kind of rehearse and do a run through. And then you'll do two live shows in front of two different live oh. studio audiences. And then you're done. And then if you have some pickups, then you work after that. But uh, most of the things I've ever done, you should, sh would shoot in front of two, like one at about two o'clock to four, you'd have a break and then come back at about six. And then they'd let in a whole different audience and they'd record both of these and kind of mix them together. But with our show on tape day, you'd get in there and we would shoot until about four o'clock, like a movie with no audience, just shooting the scenes. And they always told me, when we go in front of the audience, we've pretty much already got the show. So they use the audience uh, as the baseline, I think. And then they would throw in other post-ups and stuff. Yeah, but, but whenever you listen to any of the shows, what you're hearing is a mixture of audience, maybe a little canned laughter, and some mic writers. <laughs> <laughs> because you'll hear the that's funny going. and on just about every sitcom you'll hear these these uh, renegade laughing, ah. laughing. Ah. yeah and you know it you know it's a writer very you know distinctive laugh and, and, you know yeah. and, and i always used to say how do they keep laughing they've heard this 20 times this week but you know it's a supportive thing and it helps the actors with the beats of of the of the comedy so it it is you know but it, so when you're listening to to the uh, the laughter on sitcoms it's a little bit now a little mixture and and now it's all digital we used to have this guy that would come in and he had this box that would have all these cartridges in it and it was a secret box he invented the box and no one could see the box he would go off in a corner and 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 had all these cartridge uh, you know like radio stations used to have uh like eight track but, but they were little cartridge in here, and he would mix these things and blend them and that and he was like the master of of the audience the fake audience laughter which we didn't need much because the real audience laughed enough but he would come in and tune it a little bit but uh, it was real secret he'd lock it up and everything now they do it with digital uh files and stuff like that but it was you know an art just to, i don't know how much he made for doing it but he, he had the secret <laughs> I guess he could fine tune it so you don't hear the same exact laugh it's track art. week to week. It's art. It's, it's like it's like Foley. It's like Foley art. You know, there, there's an art to it. All right, let's watch this show. All right, let's do it. Wendy, Connie, Jr., Wendy, Graham. <laughs> what am I gonna eat? Oh, just as soon as your dad and Jr. get back from the market. If they're shopping on an empty stomach, you won't be home for days. <laughs> Sherry, that's not nice. You're right, I'm sorry. I'll be in the living room if he needs help unloading the semi. Hi. So where are the groceries? I left them on the porch. Well, bring them in here. I can't, there's not enough room. Not enough room? Yep, we better move on out there. <laughs> and that's no ball. What are you two up to? <laughs> How do you get it? We better move on. I out. got it. I got it. <laughs> Graham, you spent our food money on a cow? No, no, no. It didn't cost me a dime. Mr. Orble, the math teacher, he gave it to me. Why would Mr. Orble give you a cow? Because he likes me. <laughs> One of his kids brought it home as a pet, but they couldn't paper train it. <laughs> Graham, we don't need a cow. We have children we can't paper train. But we can't <laughs> eat them. What? Okay, maybe we could, but this is much better. <laughs> you see, all we have to do is fatten it up and then have it butchered. Yeah, see? You have no beef with that. <laughs> Graham, you don't know the first thing about raising cattle. Hey, I'm raising eight stinking kids, aren't I? Can't be that different. <laughs> I do have a question I have to ask because sure. Graham always gets a lot of fat jokes and there are several like multiple right there. Um, was that just something that you leaned into with the character or is it just because sometimes fat jokes are funny? I, I didn't care. <laughs> you know, I, I was a little, actually, I'm back to my weight that I was when I did the show, which was, let's see, what was I? I was about uh, 225. And that's about what I am now. And I'm, I'm, you know, 
little over six foot. So I've, you know, I had a little bit of a, but I was 36 years old at the time. And I didn't mind, you know, listen, anything for a laugh, ball jokes. I've been used to ball jokes. I've been ball since I was 21. So I didn't care. I did notice that there was a loop there. Um, I could uh, hear the loop about Mr. What's his name and uh, gave me, yeah, I could tell there was a definite loop there. Um, these cows, I want to just say they were real cows. There weren't guys in suits and they, uh, and they, and they did poop a lot. <laughs> I, you know, I talk about all the people who work on the show. There was a guy that had spent the week picking up the dog, or the dog, the uh, cow poop off the stage. There's not much you can do about it. What? And, and give uh, up show business? <laughs> it was actually two cows. It was actually two cows. It was a, it was a mother cow and a calf. So he had two cows on on the set at that day, or that week. Never. Oh, that's right, because the calf shows up later. That's right. I, so it was a real mother cow and her real calf. I kind of feel like later there may be a bigger version of the first calf, of the first cow, even. Yeah. But I may be remembering that. And we could we could also talk a little bit about the name when we get there too, when we get to the. Oh yes. Yes, I was, forgot about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right, here we go. Let's keep going. The game. If I can stay on the ball, take it minute by minute. I just <laughs> minute. Minute. I can stay I like the fact this episode of Autumn is very cold just as soon as everyone is here. Wendy! I'm on my way! I don't know what you've been feeding Hooter, but whatever it is, stop it! (laughs) Not Hooter. That's the biggest dog I've ever seen. (laughs) It's not a dog, it's a cow. And that manure you stepped in is as good as money. Oh, this baby's a big spender. (laughs) All right, now this is gonna be a family project, so everyone is gonna have to do their part. Now, if I have to be part of this harebrained scheme, then so do you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Elizabeth, I could use a little support here. Daddy, can I milk her? I'd love to tug on her teeth. <laughs> Great. She can do all of it. Yes, yeah, she can. Yeah. Hold it. Now, hold it. Now, hold it. Now, none of you are going to complain after we butcher this thing and sink our teeth into some big, juicy hamburgers. Slaughtered? Hamburgers come from cows? What do you think? Didn't think, just ate. <laughs> but I thought you were going to use Diane for milk. No, no, no. Milk cows aren't really worth that. But wait a minute. Diane? Well, there was no name on her tag, so I named her. Oh, you can't Diane? be naming a ta- You named her my middle name? Well, oh, nice, Marie. Well, why don't you just call me a cow to my face? Cindy, your middle name isn't Diane. It's Anne. Really? Oh, I like Diane much better. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Jay, this cow couldn't have happened at a better time. That manure is calling out to us. By name? <laughs> we can collect it and sell it. The key word here is we. Hey, this is a partnership. You just do every other day, the odd days. Wait a minute, today's the fourth. But it's day one of our partnership, and one is an odd number. <laughs> Doesn't she have the most beautiful eyes? Yeah, I hear they make a delicious soup. A chowder, I believe. <laughs> Okay, you want to stop? Yeah, so uh, Brad, you mentioned there was a story behind the the cow's name. Well, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, well, when we get to the, later on in the script, because I think it was taken out of the original script of what we called uh, something later. So I don't want to spoil that, but when we get down the road, we can talk about that. But I do remember that, uh, wasn't there, Bill, a little controversy? Because somebody on the staff was named Diane and they took it personal. Yeah. 
Yes. The casting lady, I forget what it was, Diane something, I forget what her name was. And somehow she got it into her head that we had named this cow after her. And which, there's a reason which, it was, and there's, there's a reason why we named it Diane, which will come because Diana, that lady Diana was popular at the point. This, this was a period of time when she and the prince and all that stuff, she was the hot, you know, that was a hot, so they called her, it was named after Lady Diana. That's but for a specific it. reason, which later, I think. Well, oh, I okay. Well, maybe you're re relating to something I don't remember. Yeah, 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 I am. But, I remember. Yeah. So, so let's, let's watch it. But we, we had a problem with the casting lady who was highly insulted because she, she was, you know, she wasn't a thin girl, but she wasn't like, you know. Bovine. It, 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 yeah, no, she was not bovine at all. And she took it somehow in her brain. She got real insulted and thought we had, they had named, or we had named this cow after her. And that, that was like right out of left field. I went, what? <laughs> no, not at all. But she, I don't, I don't know. know if she believed this or not, but it wasn't. So. There's a well, reason she's named Diane. Like I said. Okay. okay. So okay, I loved, I loved that Graham said you don't name the cow. I grew up on a tobacco and cattle farm. It was, it was a very small family farm. But that was a rule. Like, you don't name an animal you're going to eat. Oh, really? You, you just don't do that. Um, so I thought that was kind of, uh, I don't know, reminded me of my own childhood. Don't name the cows you're going to butcher. Mary, please help our cow, Diane. I'm afraid that my father went to slaughter her and make hamburgers for our family. It doesn't seem very fair because... She's just a beast of burden and you Marie, love her very much. what are you jabbering about? <laughs> I'm not jabbering. I'm praying for Diane, and I can't believe none of you care. Well, believe it. <laughs> are you guys sure my middle name isn't Diane? Yes. <laughs> Diane's counting the days to her execution. <laughs> Stop being so melodramatic. Cows can't count. It is obvious you haven't looked into her soft, brown, intelligent, trusting eyes. How many does she have? Fine. You all lie there. I'm going to the barn to comfort Diane. She knows I'm the only one who cares about her. Well, Diane winked at me. When? When I was flossing her teeth. <laughs> I do care. I'm going to go with you. Oh, Wendy, do you hear this insanity? Oh, just leave me alone. Connie, you ask questions about the universe? Who's to say there's not a planet somewhere where cows run things? Where they cook and clean and go to the office? Where cows wear the clothes and it's humans who are kept naked in wild herds to mate willy-nilly, panting and heaving and grunting. I lost my point. <laughs> not to mention your mind. Marie, Dad has to go through ten months of fattening up Diane. He may grow to like her. Quiet or I'll kill you myself. Then again, I could be wrong. <laughs> Connie, a cow is a terrible thing to waste. Hey, I don't want her to die. I mean, too bad she's not a milk cow. They don't get slaughtered. They don't? Mm-mm. Once a female gives birth, she's considered too tough and stringy for anything else. Much like humans. <laughs> then all we have to do to save Diane is to get her pregnant. Pregnant? All right, Marie had an impure thought. <laughs> no, that's just my work. Yeah, but where are we going to find someone who knows about studs and mating? <laughs> But you can let them hit the ground first. Is that what you do in the even days? Something like that. Cindy! Now look, this whole plan depends on Dad falling for your act, so be convincing. But don't milk it. Sorry. Attach optional hood shield to connection B. This will allow for even tenderizing and browning of meat. You said it. Cindy. The worst thing you could possibly imagine. Your mother's pregnant again? <laughs> the worst. Well, come on, uh, you gotta help me with this. This could be a lot of things. Well, some jerks wrote stuff about me all over the boys' bathroom. What did they write? Uh, are you on word 
just like that. Well, they're not so tough. They only have four letters. <laughs> well, my mom called Father Hargis and have Janet oh, and Bob I, go... No, 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 no. I don't want anyone else to read those lies, especially a school official like Janet or Bob. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll paint over those walls myself. <laughs> of course they're not true. <laughs> Cindy, perfect! Hey, if anybody should get praise, it's me. I was the one who had to spend two hours in the boys' room. Wait, you really painted those terrible things? Well, most of them are already there. I just had to paint your name over Wendy's. <laughs> Who's Wendy? She said she had to go get her makeup. Makeup? Cindy, go get her. We don't have much time. Okay. I'll keep a lookout. Okay. Hi, Diane. Tonight's your big night. Now. You'll be pleased to know that the Lord does not forbid sex among the wedding beasts of the earth. <laughs> you lucky dog. <laughs> what do you need your makeup for? Oh, not me, the cow. I don't see why the cow needs makeup. You wouldn't. <laughs> hmm, let's see. Wendy, trust me, the bull isn't going to be looking at her eyes. <laughs> hey, let's not pick on Wendy. Let's just be grateful that she has some respect for the life that God has breathed into this humble creature. Right? No, I just like to watch animals mate. <laughs> Now, earlier, did you say that this <clears throat> subplot was not in your original script the way it is on the screen? Yes. I did not. We did not write. Uh, I don't know. Brad, Brad, have you got the original script that we wrote? I I, um, I do somewhere, but I, I, I don't remember. I, I seem to think that this was, you know, maybe a, a little different version of it. But I think because that's the whole co concept of the show. I mean, of this episode was, you know, and your idea, as you said earlier, you know, get the cow, but how are they going to get it in case you don't fall in love with it? And so this was the plan. This is the plot. Yeah, I, 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 when I first saw it, I didn't like it. But when I watch it again now, I think it actually was an improvement on the, on the, on the script. It added that little naughty, edgy thing that I was talking about before that the show had, uh, you know, <laughs> animal sex. <laughs> a lot of mating <laughs> jokes in this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of mating <laughs> jokes on this. There's in, in the script, there's there's a line about the music of that they weren't they hadn't decided yet what music they were going to use. And they even had a note in the script saying th uh, they were in the process of clearing something and they would send it down to the stage, you know, or put it in post. But I like uh, that song. It's a perfect song. 
Yeah. Uh, just an old note, Robbie Countryman <laughs> was one of the uh, the girls uh, all kind of, he was one of the cute uh, assistant production, pr production assistant guys that worked on the show. Kind of would run around and do things. And all the girls, I think, thought, thought he was real cute. And, so, and plus, he had a good name. Robbie Countryman. It sounds made so, up. It's such a good name. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a real name. In fact, if you look in the credits, you might see his name. But he was like a, a production assistant guy. In fact, I think at one point he actually made an on-screen appearance, you know, delivering a package or something real short. I, I've noticed that this show has it like there was a Mikey Sullivan as like a cute boy from a neighboring school or a, a cute boy who was leaving St. Augie's mentioned. Of course, Mike Sullivan's one of the... Yeah, the producers. They used, names, they used to throw in names of uh, ABC executives. Um, they used to uh, they would take names from people I don't know where. You know, again, I wasn't part of the writing thing, but they had to come up with a name at three o'clock in the morning, and they go, "Ah, I'm not Larry." <laughs> but Robbie Countryman, Robbie Countryman, I remember that he was a young guy. He was uh, he had a cool name. I think that's why they used it. It is a good name. I yeah. love that. And just in that one scene, we got to see the personalities of all four of the oldest girls. I mean, Wendy, of course, being who she is, Cindy being so naive, and then Marie being this repressed version of Wendy. It's, it's, it was very well done. Well, you know, as I watched these, all these shows and all the scenes with the girls, they were actually like a four four member comedy team. <laughs> you know, they were, they were all, they were very tight, you know, uh, they back and forth the lines and everybody played their lines to the hilt and they all knew their comedy timing. And of all the, you know, all the scenes they've had up in their bedrooms and stuff, I sit and watch them go, wow, they, they were really, uh, you know, it's like when I watch people on the Big Bang Theory and, uh, uh, you know, that was very tight. Everybody Good was chemistry. Really tight. Yeah, the chemistry yeah. and they just had things down and it was it was really great. The, the girls were very funny and pretty at the same time. And how can you beat that? This show had I mean, plus you had four girls who were so close in age, but in this gigantic Catholic family, it it made sense for them to be sisters. I, I don't know many other concepts that could have gotten away with that. Yeah. And the chemistry between uh, Bill and uh, Graham and, and Elizabeth, his wife was also very solid and very believable mm -hmm. as, as most of the married couples that would have this many kids, you know, that they, they were a comedy duo as opposed to the comedy team of their daughters. Well, Deborah, I've, and I've told Deborah this, I said, De Deborah all, always made me look good because she's class A actress, and especially in the, in the scenes when we were had to be a little serious and some of the solo scenes that she had throughout the series were, I mean, she was just an excellent actress and she always, always made me look good. Well, you both played off each other so well. I, and I always appreciated that Elizabeth was not, she wasn't just vapid mom. Like she had her own flaws and she had her own scenes where she looked ridiculous at times in a very appropriate way. And it was, you don't see that with a lot of sitcom moms, it seems like. There's no June yeah. Cleaver. That's for sure. <laughs> Pregnancy test. Place several drops of solution into container. Then add specimen. Here's the specimen. <laughs> oh, how'd you get it? Don't ask. Just don't ask. <laughs> Ew. 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 Okay. Oh. Wait 15 seconds. If the solution turns blue, then the test indicates a positive result. Oh, this might not work. I mean, it's only been six weeks since their first meeting. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm getting tired of taking that cow to that field every night. Well, so am I, Missy. But we have to be willing to make the sacrifice. <laughs> Boy, is that blue. <gasps> Frighteningly blue. Oh, Diane's gonna be a mommy. You mean we don't get to watch anymore? <laughs> Elizabeth, I'll be out in the barn with my heifer. <laughs> Hi, Dad. What's going on? Uh, going on? What makes you think something's going on? You're happy to see me. Oh, not really. <laughs> Dad, do you really think it's healthy to hide in the barn and swill six 
beers? I'm not hiding. The beers aren't for me. They're for the cow. <laughs> Thinking beer is the best way to gain weight, or so I've been told. <laughs> well, you're not gonna feed all six beers to Diane? Of course not. I'm a gentleman. I'd never let a lady drink alone. <laughs> Elizabeth, what are you doing? Those beers aren't empty yet. Graham Lubbock, I will not sit idly by while you hide in the barn and swill six beers. Thought Marie talked to you, huh? And wasn't it a shame she had to? <laughs> I'm not drinking all six beers. I'm sharing them with the cow. Oh, right. It's true. <laughs> See, the, the cow schnockered. Say, how about fixing me and the cow some salami and cheese? Oh, Graham Lubbock, you just save it. I didn't say a word when you brought this cow home and turned everyone into a vegetarian. And I didn't even say a word when you started spending $50 a month for feed. And I even remained silent about the babies not being able to play in the yard without their snowsuits. Well, talk to JR and Sherry. They're handling the manure. Oh, just listen to yourself. Well, I don't like what this cow has done to you. <laughs> Boy, her panties in a wad. Hey, I'd like another beer, too. <laughs> so, weight gain without beer is possible. <laughs> now, JR, can I help it if nature only calls every other day? Oh, I think it's been calling. You haven't been picking up the phone. Hey, 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 what's going on here? You said I collected on odd days. But did I ever say I collect on even days? No. Shake <laughs> arm. Dad, she's a liar, a cheater, and a user. All women are like that, JR. You might as well get used to it. I, it doesn't make a difference. I'm gonna take the cow to the slaughterhouse today anyway. Okay, we can't put off telling Dad Diane's pregnant any longer. Who wants to tell him? Don't look at me. If I use the word pregnant in a sentence, I'd never get to finish it. <laughs> oh, Cindy? Sure. What is he want me to tell him? Never mind. Oh, Connie, please. Why me? Why not you? Because Dad hasn't given up hope on me. <laughs> no! What? Come on, get up. You can't expect the guy from the slaughterhouse to come here. Uh... Oh, you can't be sick. Graham, what's going on? This cow's jerking my chain. <laughs> She doesn't look very good. Oh, she's faking. Get up, you slacker. <laughs> you killed her! You could have waited for the slaughter! You had to do it yourself, hey, fat man! She's not dead. Oh. Sorry about the fat man thing. <laughs> what happened? The cow fell over. Was Sherry under it? Uh, no such luck. <laughs> I wasn't dying. She's about to become a mother. A mother? But she can't be pregnant. Well, maybe after you got her tanked on beer, she went out wandering. No, no I mean, she just... We did it. What? Uh, we, as in the three of them. All right, what's going on here? We all had a part in it. Yeah. How did you even know how to get this cow pregnant? Okay, I was there. <laughs> I can't believe it. My own children, and after all the time and money, I spent over $300 on grain alone, and it was, it was all to feed you, my family. Get out of here. They just don't understand us businessmen, Daddy. We're happy to get a little blood on our hands. Get out. <laughs> I just can't believe that they did this to me. Oh, you poor dear, your nose is warm. No, oh, I'll be all right. This just happens to me when I yell at the kids. <laughs> I was talking to Diane. Oh, so you don't understand why I did this either, huh? Oh, Graham, I do. But can you see why this is so tough on Marie? Because she's insane? <laughs> no, because she treasures every living thing. Well, yeah. So you understand? Oh, thank God. Elizabeth, will you help me with the calf? Oh, Graham, you do care about the calf. Yeah, and the mother, too. Oh, honey, of course I'll help you. <laughs> Good, because I'd hate anything to happen to them before I have them carved up into roast. Yeah. <laughs> what? What did I say? <sighs>
Can we stop? Yep, yep. Uh, I just want to say, uh, during this whole scene here in the barn, if everyone will just take a, a minute to notice the beautiful lighting of George Dibby. Uh, this is a really good example. If you notice, that the light coming in from the windows and hitting everybody. Uh, he was great at light. He always used to pay a lot of attention to the light coming in. In this, these scenes here, you can see these lights hitting us, the sunlight coming in through whatever windows there are there, coming in and hitting us and all the different the lighting in, in, in the barn here and everybody is absolutely beautiful. And that's, that's all due to George Dibby. Yeah. I noticed the lighting on the scene between uh, you and, and Heather, like the, the light through the slats of like the wall, even it was just exactly that's good attention that's, to detail. This doesn't happen. And Some the way days. the cows lit too. I mean, I noticed yeah, that. Yeah, everything. This, light, the, the, this whole barn thing is really a lot of sunlight coming through and stuff. I and, wanted uh, to George- mention, I imagine it here originally in the script that we turned in, the cow that got Diane pregnant was, we called him Chuck, Charles, Chuck, uh, for Chuck and Diane. And for some reason, they, you know, they lost it. So in terms of insulting anybody, it wasn't. It was supposed to, she was named, she, the cow was named for that reason to go with Chuck. It was just because of the times we thought that was funny. Right. All right, let's keep going. Uh, well, right. before before we do that, I do have to ask, because you and Elizabeth had a scene that started off like very sweet and then immediately um, Graham put his foot in his mouth. Um, right. What I, I guess for I don't know if this is. Again, as as a non actor, um, and I'm sure this is probably a kind of a, a dumb question, but how do you take something on like the page and make it? translate it so well to like actual emotion on the screen like that. And then for Graham to not even get any kind of emotional payoff, he ends up still being the jerk at the end. Uh, I don't know. I've always been, I mean, like, you know, I've been in some not so great movies and I just kind of have had lines and I've, through my career, I've gotten used to taking some lines that maybe aren't all that funny. And it, it, all lines have to be taken and personalized in the exact word you use. You have to put your own little twist on it. I, I don't know. I just, from all my years of watching everybody, I've developed my own, my own timing and it's, uh, and I have to credit Jackie Gleason and Red Skelton and all the people that I watch that helped me form my little character. And I think Graham Lubbock has a lot of me in him. Uh, it's not me, but there's a lot of me in it, and uh, you just uh, you just take those words and make them pop off the page and onto the screen. That's your responsibility. I always used to tell the writers, I said, you know, you may write this stuff, but if it's not funny, uh, it's coming out of my mouth. <laughs> so they don't go, oh, that that writer isn't funny. They go, well, that wasn't very funny. That thing Bill Kirkenbauer said, but you know, I was always given good. Good, good line. So it's, uh, um, this was not like the cheap B movies that I had, had been in. Uh, all the lines, again, all this stuff is honed and rehearsed and they, and they're, they're not against throwing out stuff that they know that doesn't work and everything got improved. And I just uh, took whatever I had and it was, you know, Graham was very contradictory. He would say things and then he'd do another thing and then he'd do one thing and then say another thing. So, it was, he was all, always about the, he was like water, he the, the way of least resistance. There are some comedians like Bill who could read a phone book and make it entertaining. And I think that is, is in the mix when you cast somebody that organically, they, they just are funny and they know how to be funny, and, but they also know how to be poignant and real. Just the art of which will, acting, which we'll, we'll be seeing here. <laughs> All right, let's yes, keep it. Let's, it is. It's going to have a poignant turn to it. I'm not going to start talking to you. A person does that, and the first thing you know, they start imagining a two-way conversation, and that just isn't going to happen. Ah, good. We understand each other. <laughs> what am I doing? 
I mean, you think I was the first guy in the history of the world to want to kill a cow. You know, if you would take time to read your Bible, you would see that they would just as soon slaughter a fatted calf as part the Red Sea. <laughs> I mean, who's running this stinking planet anyway? It's humans who have dominion over the Earth. That's why we get to pollute and spill oil and start wars and stuff like that. <laughs> Are you done yet over there? <laughs> nope. What's the big holdup, huh? I mean, you've been at this for... 10 minutes now. You're worse than Elizabeth. Always took her a long time, too. Who are you talking to, Dad? Who, uh, me? <laughs> I'm not talking to anyone, especially that stupid cow. <laughs> what are you doing down here? Shouldn't you be praying or something like that? Well, it's cold, and I thought this blanket would help. Oh. Well, if you think this blanket is going to make up for the fact that you took the... What about me? Dad, she's about to give birth. He's about to bring a living thing into this world. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh! Okay. Oh. All right, this could be the push now. Did you hear that, Elizabeth? Now, let's do that silly breathing. I don't want to breathe. You will breathe or you will get down and give me ten. But breathe. <laughs> Okay, all right, here it comes. Uh, don't tell me it's another girl. What is it, Doctor? He said not to tell. Oh, Elizabeth, we have another baby girl. Oh, yes, honey, they're going to keep us young. Oh, I don't think we have a choice. <laughs> I just hope when I start turning into a bullheaded know-it-all like my father, at least one of my kids will put up a fight. Honey, if they don't, I will. <laughs> Coach, would you like to hold your new baby daughter? Oh, yeah, are you kidding? Oh, you'd never believe... Oh, my God! It's happening! Oh, don't just lay there. Come on, push. Push and breathe. Push and breathe. But not like that, because that'll make you real dizzy. Come on. Come on, push. Come on, it's almost... Come on, Mama. Push just a little bit more. Oh my God! Holy cow! It's a girl. I know how you feel. <laughs> now I have six of my own. <laughs> I don't have to wait anymore. <gasps> Boy or girl? <laughs> girl. Oh. <laughs> I had these left over from baby Melissa's birth. You know, Graham, you seem truly excited. Well, yeah, it's a... Uh, uh... Are you just going to stand there with that silly smile, or uh, can I light you a cigar? <laughs> <laughs> now, will you dance for me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh Elizabeth. Thanks for being as tough on me as your daughters were. Oh, honey, my pleasure. Mm. Well, they don't look so tough now, though, do they? <laughs> no. They're beautiful. Just like little angels. <laughs> Fire! <laughs> Settle down, there's no fire. But, Dad, the only time you smoke cigars is when there's... a little bit tired. Let's let her have some rest. Uh, Diane? Uh, I heard it, too. Well, that's what Marie calls her. Oh, Daddy, can we go see the mother and child before you have them killed? <laughs> well, you see, uh, I kind of figured that maybe we could uh, keep them both. <gasps> Fascist Connie said you were. Well, I just kind of figured if we kept them as milkers, uh -huh. yeah, Daddy, the... you are no different than the rest of us women. No, 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 yeah, it just kind of follows my dollar. Oh, uh, that's okay. We don't care if you're soft. Yeah, yeah, I just wish I'd known this all the nights I snuck out. <laughs> not a softie. Tell him, Elizabeth. That's right. 
Your father is one of the most cold and heartless men I've ever met. And don't let me ever hear you say different. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll turn the volume down there so we can talk over the credits. I, 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 I Robbie Cooper today. <laughs> Did you? Really? Yeah, what were you gonna say? Jeremy? Oh, I was gonna say I hate that you all had this good season finale that had to be your series finale, and I yeah. there are a lot of us who are still pretty angry about it. Well, I'm I'm one of them. It was something that was. Uh, you know, it's been talked about. Uh, I went on a vacation, and they told us if we stayed at, I think we were getting a 21 share. And they said, hey, if you're staying there, don't worry. So I went off on a summer vacation uh, to Asia uh, with my wife and came back, and I got a call and said, well, we're not on the schedule. I'm one of the producers. And I couldn't believe it because we had... Mm -hmm. We're getting great ratings, actually. Yeah, out of and, like forty shows, you were number twenty. Yeah, well, it would have it would have gotten better. Yeah, and the show, the girls would have uh, gotten, uh, you know, um, I, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't the thing that should have happened. It wasn't uh, the thing, you know, would have made a big difference. But um, you know. Nothing, that's where that uh, old adage uh, that show business comes from. I was one more season, eight. one more season, I would have gone into syndication, and that yeah, was you that would have made a difference. Yeah, uh, that's what they say, you know, that's that show business. I was very angry about it for about a year. I just uh, was like, well, how, how could this happen? How could it? And uh, they had hopes of maybe moving it to someplace, uh, another network they had talked about the Warner Brothers network, I think at the time was it active. Um, and that's happened before. It happened with Tim Allen show. You know, you get picked up by another network. It's not something that hasn't hasn't happened before. And uh, that went on for about two weeks. I thought, oh, they'll 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 pick it up. They'll move it. And it uh, it 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 didn't happen. Uh, and when the show's uh, going places, in fact, it's funny. I was going through some of my stuff the other day. I came through a review of Going Places, which was the show that uh, they replaced our show with. And it was a terrible review. It said Going Places isn't. <laughs> it was a, was a view, and it did. It was, it was a terrible. If I remember correctly, they like got, got two, two, three weeks into it and changed the whole f situation of the sitcom. Uh, they just totally erased it and made it something else, and uh, it, it, it didn't go anywhere. It, it died. But you know what? Uh, I, I, I would have thought that they would have come back to us and go, "Hey, you know, we made a mistake. We signed some contracts and uh, put it back up on the air in six months," which would have been totally possible to do. But that didn't happen. So I don't know. I seem to remember, you do, but... though, that you were going to take out an ad in Variety, like a full page ad with the word canceled on your uh, head, printed <laughs> yeah. on your head. Yeah. yeah it would be, it'd be it's a great kind of like, you know, uh, to uh, not to uh, get back at them, but just it's funny. It would have been funny and, you know, and expensive. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. There's not much you can, you know, I, I'm glad it happened. It was a great show. Um, hey, I I always think stranger things have happened. And I'd like to think uh, maybe someday somebody might call me up and go, hey, Bill, you want to come back and do, you know, at least do a final episode or a get together. They did a growing base get together. Well, this should I be a, right? it, it should have gone on TV land or someplace like, you know, one of those, should, Nick at Night. Well, it, it was the music. It was the music. That's what I've always been told. I don't know why. I mean, I've seen music on other shows, so I don't know why they couldn't go back and renegotiate them. If I had a song on one of these shows that was popular 30 years ago, I'd be happy if somebody came back to me and said, hey, we want to we want to buy your song back. I, I, I think it was mostly the songs that the girls did in the uh, in the pizza parlor, but I don't it seems know. Seems like if you control. cleared it for that episode, it sh it means you have the rights to use it. That's kind of strange. Evidently, not a, to perpetuity. Oh. That that it wasn't part of the deal. But I don't know. You know, nobody visioned envisioned what the world was going to be. Nobody envisioned at that point uh, DVDs, 
uh, in fact, maybe not even VHS tapes that much. I don't know if they were released in old TV shows on VHS at that point, but you know, DVDs and certainly not streaming and YouTube and the futuristic stuff that we're dealing with now, um, which you know is an outlet for it. Um, but you know, hey, I'm I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. Uh, I could do uh, I could do a season or two. I don't know. Strange things happen. You know, there's they're scratching around looking for ideas. Maybe sometimes somebody will decide to do this again. I don't know. They'll probably hire somebody else to play me. <laughs> we would riot. You know, the fans would riot. Can't, can't do that. <laughs> I had him. I had him threaten me with Dick Butkus once. <laughs> And he says, "If you if you quit ad, if you quit ad libbing and making stuff up, we're gonna go get Dick Buck- Buckus." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> is there?" And I realize this is asking a very uh, probably ignorant question. That is there anything the fans of this show could do to potentially see I don't know just the twelve of us or a reunion movie or something happen. Like, who should we reach out to and express our interest? Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers owns it. ABC, you know, and people, again, don't understand how things work. Studios produce product and sell it to networks. So, uh, but they don't usually produce product unless they got a network to buy it already. So it's a combination of, uh, but the ownership of just the 10 of us lies with Warner Brothers. So and, they and, would have- and Jeremy's right. The fans can do something because um, letters and emails, uh, even social media uh, commentary means a lot because they know if they get one letter from a fan, there's probably a thousand people who think the same way that, you know, just didn't, were too, not lazy, but they just didn't sit down and write it out. So yeah, it, it, letters, emails, you know, uh, social media to Warner Brothers might have an impact. Yeah, you know, the, uh, Jimmy Kimmel and Norman Lear have been doing these uh, redos of some of the old shows from the 1970s. Yeah, um, that live in know, front of a studio audience. Yeah, except they're using different actors, recasting them. Sometimes all right, sometimes in my opinion, not all so great. But, uh, you know, they can reboot this show. Deborah's still around, I'm still around, all the girls are still around. The producers are still around. I, I don't know how that works. I'm just, I sit around and tend to my retirement and uh, being happy. And if I happen to get a telephone call one day, uh, so be it. <laughs> I just hope at times they just figure out they're going to do it. I know how to answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Yeah, Bill Kirkenbauer is not here anymore. Where's Bill? Oh, I don't know. Hey. Yeah, Bill said he'd do it, but we got to go to Thailand to shoot it because. <laughs> I'm sure people would be up for that. It seems like a beautiful country. It, it, Thailand is wonderful. It's, it, it's a wonderful place. My wife and I over here, mostly my, I came over here because my, my son went to college here. And uh, I, uh, and I'm not married to a Thai girl. People, when I say my son went to college in Thailand, people go, oh, uh, is he part, uh, part nine? No. Uh, I, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the quick story is that, that that vacation I told you I took that summer, we went on a tour of a cruise of Asia. I've always loved Asian culture. And we went and we went to Thailand. That's when we first went to Thailand. And so everything's kind of come full circle. Um, and then I took my son when he was about 16 and he did a lot of TV commercials. I got him an agent and he did a lot of TV commercials, made some money. And I took him on a vacation to Thailand. And he fell in love with it, uh, decided he was going to buy a condo over here. And then he went decided he wanted to go to college over here. And I thought he was crazy. And then he talked to my wife and I, uh, and I end up buying uh, a condo over here to retire. And this has been planning for about seven to eight years uh, of this. And so finally, in the last six months, we, we finally got over here in COVID. It took us uh, a year to do something that should have taken 48 hours with a nine month stop in Cambodia. But now we're finally here in Bangkok. But well, listen, it's an easy thing to hop on a plane fly back to LA, you know, <laughs> I, a friend of mine works on the, uh, uh, true bloods or true blood. Yeah. True bloods, bl- blue bloods, blue bloods. And he says, true Tom blood so sounded like- right too. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. There was a show called true blood, but yeah, yeah the vampire right. show. Oh, oh, really? Uh, 
Blue Bloods, well, whatever the one with Tom Selleck is. And if uh, he works on the show and he says Tom flies in from Hawaii or something, he comes in, he does all his scenes, he gets on a plane and flies back, and two weeks later he comes back. I don't know. Anything's possible. Just get me before I don't know where I am and have to wear diapers. <laughs> And you look the same, so you got that good. <laughs> well, Jeremy, that's that was the end of it. I personally thought that was a very funny show. Uh, I I liked this episode in particular. Uh, I remember watching this with my dad again, who was we had a cattle farm, and I remember him saying, "Why isn't the cow standing up? Cows give birth standing up," and that is such a distilled memory I have of the first time I watched this. And he's like, well, I guess, you know, <laughs> I guess I don't know how to do I, that in Hollywood. I wanted to say one thing. I'm glad you said that, uh, that there's one shot of the little baby calf, which is an actual shot that they went up to whoever the guy that owns the cows and they hung around because they knew the cow was going to give birth. And there's that one shot of the little calf trying to stand up. That was actually taken in the barn when it, at, a few minutes after it was born. It looked it. I thought I, I thought it was some kind of stock footage because I could tell it wasn't no, in, you know yeah, the same went, barn. But they yeah. sent a cameraman up there because they knew the cow was going to be given birth, and they sat there. And they, I think they waited for several hours before it actually happened. But uh, that that is an actual uh, shot of that of that little calf being being born. Or I just want to say that the potato chips you were eating were the biggest damn potato chips <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> First of all, you don't take nobody eats a potato chip taking a little, like, a little baby bite out of it. Oh, shit. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to it's hard to ask. people don't realize. We, one of the hardest things Ooh. to do is to act and eat at yeah. the same time. And if you notice, a lot of movies, a lot of TV shows, they spend a lot of time putting the food up to their face and then putting it back down or pushing the food around or so because you know you got to time it so that you don't go and it's spit buckets too because if you do 30 takes of taking a bite yeah. out of a cheeseburger you, you know after about mm. three or four you're you know put it in you know we have we had that one show where uh the diet show with me and uh one Jamie. of my favorites i love that one yeah i love that that was a good show that was a very funny show and we had to deal with tripe all week because <laughs> that was part of the joke. You know, the tripe I throw to the dog and stuff. And they had real tripe cooked. And I've never eaten tripe and never probably will. Uh, but we had to deal with it all week. And I think I had to chew a couple pieces at one point. And it was just, uh, and they did have a spit bucket. But it was... <laughs> well. But there's nothing, nothing harder than acting at a table. If you ever watch people eating at a table, eating food, cutting food, doing all that, and then still doing your lines and not messing it up because you got food in your mouth, it's a hard thing to do. That was one of those things, like I saw a line of once you are told about this, it's like the Wilhelm scream. Once you notice it, you never not notice it. And I've watched so many sitcoms where they just move the food around on their plate. Yeah. Or, yeah and it's, they never eat it ever. But it makes yeah. sense. All right. Well, it's not usually warm. <laughs> well, well, anyway, thank you all so anyway. much for taking time out of your day to do this. I, I cannot thank you enough as a fan and as you know, the guy who runs this, this channel. And I know this is going to be very, very well received. The, the last one has gotten like 5,000 views already. So I know this one is going to be oh, big really? as well. So, wow. People, well, people want to hear I from you. Seen, I haven't seen this episode since it aired. So thank you for bringing it back. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very grateful. And again, I'm not alone. I just, I'm the, the guy having to do it first. And then it, it, I got these clean copies and it took off. Did we ever mention about Brad? Well, Brad, Brad is an award-winning playwright. We didn't. No, we have not. Yeah. So. Um, and he does other things. I don't know what things you might want to mention. Why might want, but Brad, why don't you. Well, no, I mean, I'm kind of one of these guys that isn't happy just being a writer. I'm also a comedian and an actor because, you know, I, it, it's like in show business, you have to be, you know, like a Hoover vacuum. You have to have a lot of attachments, but you can't suck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I've written a number of plays that are done quite a bit around the country, around the world, actually, and published with Samuel French. And uh, I think, like with Bill, I think you become a better writer when you're a better performer because you know 
even for stage, you know how this is going to sound. So when we write scripts, you know, you go like, eh, that's not going to be easy for an actor to say, or it does, isn't going to sound natural. So, you know, being, being a writer performer, and Bill does a lot of writing too, and the projects we've worked on, we wrote a number of screenplays together, um, that it does, it, it helps. And as an actor, it helps him being a writer because he then knows how to deliver the words that he wrote. My my most recent project that I uh, is making the rounds at film festival, but I produced a film mm -hmm. called Taking Al Back Home, which is a documentary about me taking my highly decorated father's uh, World War II hero father's ashes back to uh, Muskegon, Michigan, uh, because I was going to Thailand and I couldn't take him with me, and um, he died in about 1992. Three, I think it was, and my mother got his ashes, and then she kept them for 15 years, and then I got them. And when I, we decided to come to Thailand, I told my wife, I said, I, I got to make good on his last wishes, and so I knew I had to make this trip up to Michigan to take his his ashes and put them in this river in his hometown of Hesperia, Michigan. And I said, Am I going to fly or drive? And I don't think they'll let me fly with these ashes, so I decided to drive. And then I decided, hey. I'm going to make a movie about this. So I got a, a, a guy with a camera and a few guys with cameras and I made a documentary. Uh, that, uh, this is about three years ago. It's taken me a while to do it. I just finished it about last, last October, I think. And it's making its round in film festivals. I won a few laurels on it, but it's called taking Al back home. And, um, I'm got a few things in the works to get that. Hopefully that'll be viewable, uh, on Amazon or Netflix or one of these places really where you can good. watch. It's really good. It's, yeah, Brad, Brad Cena. It's one of the probably I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of that I've done in my career. It'll probably be one of the last things I do in my career. Uh, but until it's, the um, Just the Ten of Us reboot, so uh, yeah, until the Just the Ten of Us reboot. But, but it's I've, very I've inter it's entertaining. It's funny, but it's also very poignant, and it just it has everything going for it. Better than most. Yeah, I really I enjoyed. It. I think it's one of the better things I've ever done, and so I. You know, I want. I'm a. I'm an actor. I'm a storyteller, and, and this is one of the better stories. It's my story. It's my father's story. But ultimately, uh, as you see it, and it's kind of a punchline, surprise ending to it. But it ultimately is is my story too. It's very personal uh, uh, work that I that I did. So that's what I'm working on. I'm not just sitting over here eating pad thai and uh, <laughs> looking at the sunsets. Well, I was going to ask where we can where we can see it. So you're hoping it'll be on like Amazon or Netflix. I'm hoping within the next year. So I have something in the works that's going to bring it to uh, to uh, a, a little a larger bring view. Bring it to the here. forefront. Get get a little buzz going on. Something I have something in the work that's going to hopefully get a buzz. It's all about buzz and people seeing it. But well, it's uh, something I'm proud of. But I look I forward to seeing produce, it. I also produce a show called the Ultimate Robert Williams Tribute Experience, which is a tribute of a Robert Williams lookalike show. I started out years ago doing a show called uh, The Legends of Comedy. I was in Vegas one time watching all these Michael Jackson, Elvis, Cher impersonators. I thought, you can do that with singers. Can you do that with comedians? And so for, in 1996, I put together a whole troupe of uh, Rodney Dangerfield, Jay Leno, Jack Benny, Red Skelton, all these. And I did that for several years. And then slowly a lot of them died and uh i have this uh, gentleman who i've been working with and hired him back then to do robin williams when robin was still alive and uh after robin uh, passed away we put this tribute show because people loved robin and and like all tributes like elvis and stuff people these are characters that are so beloved that people don't want to let go the fans don't want to let go they want to keep getting that experience and a lot of people never saw robin perform live uh, stand up, and that's what this show is. And if anybody wants to see, uh, uh, they can go to robinexperience.com. It's robinexperience.com and take a look at the video and stuff. And and I spend my time producing that show. We do performing arts centers and casinos and private theaters and corporate events and things like that. So that's that's pretty much what I do. Well, I saw yeah. a flyer for that on your Facebook, and the the man who plays Robin Williams, like. I had to do a double take. Like he has a remarkable oh. physical similarity. Oh, not only that, but just the, the voice. His name is Roger Caper. 
and he has a voice and that he and i know rob i mean i worked with rob and i knew robin but when he hit town in los angeles and i watched him all through the years so i know when i worked with them and so i know his little nuances and i know and roger is a master impressionist and it's uh it's more than an impression really an impression is something you do for 30 seconds this is he does a full performance and it's uh it, it's very cathartic for a lot of uh um audience members they come to it and they see they end up crying it uh, has very poignant and he does a master it's a magical show it really truly is is a magical show and i put a lot of effort into that because i know robin was loved and and um it's a great thing to do you know i enjoy doing that all right well bill and brad i have taken up enough of your time today but thank you so much for doing this i have greatly enjoyed it and I will hopefully get this posted this week once I've I've edited it and made it look nice because um, Zoom isn't the most YouTube friendly. You got to do a little tweaking there. But well, I think we all look pretty good. You know, I, that's how I'm going to market it. Three guys who look pretty good. So <laughs> three, guys, three guys that look good. All right. Well, thank you all so much, Bill. Have a thank wonderful you, night, and Brad. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Jeremy. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Talk to you later.